Thank you for being here and joining us uh, this morning. My name is Jim Moore, and uh, this is my son, Jean-Michel, who is assisting me. And uh, like I said, I'm going to do a shout out every time to some place in the world. <laughs> We're going to give a shout out to France. <laughs> I got an email from one of the elders there, uh, Henri, who is listening online from Marseille, France. So, welcome. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I'll say bonjour, André Yves, and uh, bonjour à toute l'église. Yes. There we go. Okay, so before we get going, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jean-Michel to pray for us. All right. Well, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and uh, we're eager to learn. We're eager to, uh, uh, to hear from, from you uh, through your word. And Lord, uh, without you, uh, we're lost. We're completely lost. Um, we're lost before knowing you, but even knowing you, we need you uh, to be led into all truth. So Holy Spirit, we just ask for your help. We invite you. Uh, open our eyes, Lord. We submit ourselves to you and uh, uh, teach us, Lord, uh, through your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, let's get started this morning. And uh, first, first of all, just kind of administratively, we have uh, some paperwork out out front. We have um, a handout you can take notes uh, from if you'd like. Uh, also, we replenished um, this study guide uh, that's uh, free. Feel free to pick it up. Uh, there's plenty of copies out there. Also, we've got the uh, book, The Book Ends the Christian Life. Um, great book. Um, if you uh, would like to pick it up, please do. Uh, $10 out there, uh, super inexpensive, low cost, high value. This is a gem of a book. This is what we're going to be going through. Um, Pastor John said, hey, if you don't have 10 bucks, bring it next week. If you don't have 10 bucks next week, just forget about it. Just take the book. So uh, we just, that's right. <laughs> Ken's okay with it. All right. Excellent. Uh, let me see. Uh, we do have some uh, materials that we'll make available um, uh, online. Uh, this is streaming on YouTube. So you can go to the YouTube uh, channel uh, for Christ Our Hope. If you missed last week, last week was about uh, the vision for uh, being a disciple-making church, uh, which is what our desire is. So uh, feel free and uh, jump on and, and watch uh, last week's if you'd like. We'll also have some resources and PDFs available on the Christ Our Hope Bible Church uh, website as well. Um, also, let me give you this email address. So we have an email address uh, here on screen. If you'd like some supplemental materials, we're going to, um, we'll have some of that stuff uh, next week uh, with chapter one of the bookends. Uh, so uh, if you would like to receive supplemental information and, and documents, uh, just shoot a, an email to, to that. Even an introduction one we have. We do, actually. Yeah. So yeah. sign up and we'll send you some good stuff. I warn you in advance, they're kind of long, like 20-some pages. So for those that are really interested in getting in deep into uh, this, uh, uh, you can have those. But you have to request them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please do. Okay. Well, so um, I don't know if anybody's been guilty of this, but uh, uh, skipping uh, the introduction in a book have you ever been so excited about reading a book that you kind of like, oh yeah, there's an introduction. I'm just going to go straight to chapter one. Guilty as charged, done that. Um, actually, in this this book, the book ends the Christian life. Um, it's a it's a great little introduction, but we're going to spend some time and slow down. It's kind of like going on a a walk or a bike ride on a, a journey that you've been in a car a thousand times, and when you walk that same, same road, you see all sorts of really cool things, right? So they were there before, I just didn't notice them. So that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna kind of downshift a little bit and get a perspective uh, on the book itself, uh, for one. And then secondly, we're gonna pose some really good questions to get us thinking. Uh, thinking maybe a little bit deeper as we get ready to study through the bookends of the Christian life. So that's what we're gonna do. 
um, let's get started with uh, some real life questions. So you'll be familiar with these. Uh, they're found in the, the bookends um, at the end of the introduction. So you, uh, if you uh, read along with us, read the introduction, these will seem uh, pretty familiar. So dad, um, why these questions? Why are they helpful for us to keep them in mind? Uh, they're really uh, important and worth highlighting because uh, we need to find the answers to these questions uh, for ourselves, for our own growth. But also, if we're going to be doing discipleship with others, we need to have a way that we feel comfortable in terms of explaining it. So uh, uh, listen carefully for uh, yourself, but also in thinking ahead, uh, how can I communicate this to others? Okay, let's go for the first question. How can I overcome persistent guilt? That's a key question that we're uh, looking to answer in through this study. Uh, second one is, how can I deal with the pressure to measure up? Hmm. How about this one? Where can I find the motivation it takes to grow? Here's another one. How can I live the Christian life with both my head and my heart? Mm -hmm. How can I be sure God loves me? Here's another good one. The last one. How can I change in an authentic and lasting way? If I ask a show of hands with everyone here that has struggled with any of these questions, <laughs> uh, would you be uh, willing to raise your hand? Well, I'm not going to make you do that, but uh, at some point in, in our lives, if we're honest, we've all struggled with one or several of these uh, questions. Uh, I had somebody that uh, said, uh, you know, uh, I know God loves me, but I don't feel like he likes me. So that's the kind of question you might get, and you need to understand, well, how do I answer that? Uh, because it's very important. Uh, for myself, I'd say... Uh, I've struggled from time to time with some of these questions, if I'm honest, and I hope you are too. But we all know that we need an answer to these questions. I had one guy that read through those, and, and he wanted me to give, me, give him the answers right now. And I said, well, that's the way you need to go through the book <laughs> together. So he was motivated to go. So it's great news. Uh, we're going to be answering these throughout the whole series, not only uh, with the first book in, but also the second book in in January. So you don't want to miss all of these sessions. Well, so in our discussion, um, one of the things that you feel strongly about is that we understand the logic of the book. So that's kind of where you wanted to go next, understanding the structure and uh, uh, the pieces and the components uh, through that. Yeah, it's very important to stop and say, well, why has it been put together this way? Yeah, what is the logic of the author? Um, Otherwise, uh, uh, you, you won't really get the connections very well. So I'm going to try to uh, lead us through that uh, and explain why uh, it's been laid out this way and why I think it's laid out this way. Uh, what is the, the first chapter? Why is it so important? <clears throat> Most Christians do not really fully understand these long theological terms like uh, justification, uh, they think they do, but if you push it and say, well, tell, tell me what it really means, yeah. and then they come up blank. Or righteousness, which is the title of the first chapter. Uh, these two are not the same thing. They, uh, they're, they're different. However, most people think, and most Christians think, well, they're kind of the same. That's kind of a generalist kind of way of thinking about it, and you lose a lot of the the uh, richness that's in, uh, in these words. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones had the humility to admit this. Uh, great man of God, uh, last century in, in Britain, uh, great preacher. 
But in his uh, early uh, years, when he was just uh, more speaking as an evangelist, preaching repentance and come to Jesus, you know, kind of message, uh, there was an older pastor in the audience who came up and, and said, uh, I'm not hearing a whole lot about the work of Christ. He was humble enough to take that advice, and he went into his, uh, his study and began to really reflect and get some books. And, and here's what he said. Superficial views of the work of Christ produce superficial Christian lives. We don't want to be like that. We want to delve into the riches of everything that the gospel is, all the truths that are related to the gospel, not just use the word and say, okay, we all know what that word means, gospel. Do we really? There are two parts uh, to the great exchange. And if I was calling uh, you know, that first chapter, I would say it's the great exchange. And Bridges also has another book that's on that, uh, Great Exchange. The first part of the exchange is forgiveness. And it's about sin. It's about, it's negative. Removing the impurity that causes obstacle. So that's the first part of the great exchange. The second part is the title of the chapter, The Righteousness of Christ. It's adding positive, it's adding righteousness. We need not only forgiveness, but we need righteousness. That's a great exchange. So uh, the great exchange is when God puts our sins upon Christ our sin bearer, and he then transfers to us the perfect righteousness of Christ. If those words don't resonate in your heart, I pray that not only this morning, but through the study of the whole book, you will be in awe and wonder of this. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, but even yesterday as I was kind of putting the of polishing the, the end of preparation on this, uh, I was just seized again by the wonder and awe of this. I can explain some of it, but there is a part of it that is a mystery. Mm -hmm. If there's no mystery in your gospel, you haven't understood the gospel. You haven't understood the connection with Christ and with God. We do not totally comprehend the things of God. So, uh, but what is this something added? Something added. What was that something added called righteousness? Okay, I'm going to be asking questions more than giving answers. So you might want to ask, write these down. Is that righteousness my faith? Is it my Christian vir virtues? Is it my spiritual growth? Or is that righteousness the progress that I make in spiritual disciplines? No. Actually, it is none of these things. It's none of these things. What is it then? Well, the reformers called it an alien righteousness. Uh, I like to use that because it, it kind of perks up your ears and you say, alien, <laughs> alien righteousness, what is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it is something outside of us. It's not something that we possess in ourselves. So it's something outside of us. Uh, but, okay, it's something outside of us. Then how is it transferred to us? We'll get into that next week. How does that actually happen? How is it transferred to us? It is this mystery that we will be uh, studying. It's foundational to the whole book. And we need to address that. And second, the second chapter, why is it important? Well, the second chapter actually is part of the first book in. The two go together. That is the first book in. So uh, what is the motivation of the gospel? That's the title. Uh, okay, what is the motivation that drives the Christian life? That's important too. Let's see, let me ask some questions to provoke some thought. 
Is the motivation for the gospel of the Christian life driven by my commitment to Christ? Is it driven by my Christian duty? Is it driven by my fear of not measuring up? Or is it driven by my feelings of gratitude? None of those. And we'll talk more extensively about that when we get to chapter 2 in a couple of weeks. But briefly, I will say this in passing. Our feelings are up and down. My feelings do not define truth. My feelings lie to me. <laughs> so, how do we determine truth? By the Word of God. So, uh, where, where am I here in my notes? Uh, uh, that is not a stable foundation, my feelings. Uh, so, uh, what, what about chapter 3? Why, why is it important? Why is self-righteousness interjected here? It almost feels awkward. You know, well, why, how come all of a sudden we're talking about self-righteousness? Well, it's really crucial. Uh, it has a, a, a great significance because I say it's a sin of self-righteousness. And we all struggle with it. I did have a guy come in uh, to my office here some time ago and said, well, I really don't think I have a lot of this, you know, but the next chapter got problems with persistent guilt. I said, well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, because we all struggle with self-righteousness. So uh, you need to understand, though, that uh, chapter 3, self-righteousness, goes with chapter 9, which is self-reliance. And we'll talk about that when we get there. We all struggle with both. Pride is the hidden viper of the soul, says Jonathan Edwards. The sin of presumptuous snobbery, as I call it, is the belief that my current biblical knowledge is enough. After 50 years of uh, meditating and preaching and teaching these things, uh, I've not arrived yet, so... <laughs> Uh, it's never enough. My current uh, level of biblical knowledge is never enough. I'm already familiar with these things, uh, you might say. Well, that's presumptuous snobbery, really. I already know these things. Boy, I've heard that so many times. You know, I thumb through the book and I say, well, yeah, well, it, you know, I, I know all these things. Well, you say you know all these things before you even read it. <laughs> it's a little bit presumptuous. So, uh, but look out, this leads to complacency in the Christian life and must be addressed. And that's why he puts it up uh, very close to the beginning. You cannot teach someone who supposedly already knows all that you could tell them before they even start. Mm -hmm. So how about chapter 4? Chapter 4, persistent guilt is usually seen by those struggling with a, a per a besetting sin with the hope of finding finally the answer to this vicious cycle of regret and guilt. That is the most common one I find. Chapter 4 exposes the root problems linked to persistent guilt and accompanying despair. But chapter 6 to 8, and then we'll hit that in January, so hang on, we'll get there. 6 to 8 speaks about uh, fighting sin in detail and uh, how to do it. That's uh, very important. These chapters we'll look at then when we get there. Why is chapter 5 so important? Trusting the foundation, which is chapters 1 and 2. We go through how, how we build our faith in such a way as to uh, have confidence in uh, the first bookend. But how can we have confidence that leads to transformation of life? Mm -hmm. That's what we're after. Mm -hmm. That's great. So the first, first bookend uh, is Christ's righteousness 
and uh, his compelling love, uh, essentially the ability um, of the gospel to motivate us as believers. Um, so, Dad, you're saying really there's a big emphasis on the first bookend. Uh, really, it's motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's maybe a key to, to underline and get in our minds. Uh, yet the second uh, bookend, which is about the Holy Spirit, right? Can you kind of give us an understanding of if, if the first is about motivation, what's the second all about? It's about the power. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have a high school basketball uh, team and they, they're all motivated to win the championship this year, but do they have the power? <laughs> do they have the capacity? Do they have the players? Do they have everything needed to make it there? Oh, different story. We can be motivated, and we need to be motivated, and we need to have the right motivation. It's not some of the things I had mentioned, but uh, we also need the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Motivation by itself is insufficient. We need something more than motivation. We also need strength and power to carry out our motivation. So, chapter 7, and that was chapter 6, chapter 7 is our dependent responsibility. What is the idea here? Do we just let go and let God do it? I've heard that one before. Or do we just do the best we can? Or do we assume that God, being full of mercy and grace, he'll understand All of these things are blatantly false. So I'm trying to create some suspense here so that you want to know the answers. The answers we're given as we go through all of the materials. So I'm not going to give them in five minutes right now. (laughs) So, uh, Okay, so you say, uh, where do we get the power? To live the impossible life. Now, that is important we need to realize that the christian life is actually an impossible life for us to live on our own with our own strength and power Uh, verse uh, or chapter eight uh, is important is on the help of the divine encourager the holy spirit gives us hope and encouragement Uh, but we also need the expulsive power of a new affection I hope you're kind of saying, well, what's that about? Well, I'm not going to give you an answer. You've got you to gotta keep in here and, uh, and do the whole study. What does it mean and how do we get it? That's in chapter 8. Uh, chapter 9 is, like I said before, self-reliance, and it's the gospel enemy number 3. Self-righteousness is repulsive. Persistent guilt is debilitating and miserable. But self-reliance, that seems attractive. That seems like a good thing, even desirable, like self-confidence, self-sufficiency, especially to Americans, independent, self-sufficient. So how do we walk by faith then? How do we walk by the Spirit? What does it mean to be Spirit-filled? We often hear these expressions in the Christian community without any Explanation. <laughs> it is, everybody's supposed to know. Well, I find everybody doesn't know. Why is the 10th chapter important? Leaning on and trusting and the second book in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to trust in the enabling power of the Holy Spirit in life and in ministry? How do we behold the glory of God for transformation in our lives? How do we live the life of another? You heard me right. How do we live the life of another? Galatians 2.20. This seems strange to us and impossible, and it should. We'll talk about the dangers of legalism in chapter 10 and the dangers of license to sin and carelessness on the other. These two extremes but there is an answer for, for that. That's great. Now, thank you, Dad, for taking us through those. Um, so uh, today we're looking at three questions uh, that we talked about last week and highlighted. 
Um, so before getting really into the substance of the bookends, chapter by chapter, what are the three essential questions that you want to take us through today? Well, send the, your hand out. Then, uh, what, is my, what is the mystery of the gospel? Are you even convinced that there's a mystery to the gospel? What is the mystery and how does God do it? Mm -hmm. Maybe next week we'll get into that in detail. How is the mystery revealed? Who reveals it? Well, it's the Holy Spirit, just briefly. And then number three, where do we find the power to live the impossible life? I had a young man come up to me after I finished a seminar some years ago, and I had just briefly referred to uh, the bookends of the Christian life. He came up smiling, triumphant, and said, I read that book. He said proudly, and he said, I, I read the, the first book in, but I already knew all these things. I smelled presumption, <laughs> but I continued to listen. Then suddenly, he was no longer smiling, and he said, I was most interested in the second part, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And he promptly walked away. A little bit surprised. Uh, it, it was obvious that he didn't find what he was searching for. Why didn't he find it? Because he didn't take the first book in seriously at all. He was quenching the Holy Spirit. There's presumptuous pride. And he found nothing in the book whatsoever. Put it back up on his shelf and he was done. He'd done a program or he read a book. Why didn't he find what he wanted? It was because he was quenching the Holy Spirit. But also remember what I said last week. Half-heartedness seldom finds anything worth having. It wasn't because it wasn't there. It's because his heart was not prepared with humility. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, let's talk about this, this mystery, the uh, mystery of the gospel. Okay, well, uh, let me ask a question for us to ponder for a moment. Uh, when I think of my relationship with God, am I in wonder and awe? Be honest. Am I in wonder and awe? Am I amazed and blown away by the wonder of God's love for me and what he has done? And that I haven't really completely understood all there is in the gospel, all the gospel truths, the doctrines of grace, have I really understood the gospel in its entirety? If not, why not? The following verses speak to uh, the gospel as mystery revealed, a mystery that should blow me away, and it should every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's all read these through. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. What a wonderful verse. Can't even imagine it. And Ephesians 3.19 and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There's a precious verse, isn't it? And let's look at a third. Hebrews 2, uh, verses 1 and 3. There, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We can often be in danger of oversimplifying the gospel. As a young missionary did that. <laughs> well, I just need to prepare short statements about the truth, and it's all I need. No, it isn't all I needed. We're in danger of oversimplifying the gospel, even to ourselves. Mm to the point of making it abstract truth. What's the problem there? 
there's no person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's abstract truth about God, about Christ, about what he done. The blessings he gives me, that's abstract. What we need is the real Christ, the person. So, it can be an abstract truth. And that leads to lukewarmness in our lives and a loss of the wonder and the awe. And worse yet, it can lead to a false gospel. The gospel that I heard growing up was this. Believe in Jesus. He will forgive your sins. And if, if you accept him, you won't go to hell, but you'll go to heaven. Frankly, that, that's all I heard and all I knew. And you know what? I, I believed it. But let me tell you a secret. I believed these things long before I was born again. <laughs> Believing in Jesus is one thing. Believing in the gospel generally is another. But there is no power to change the life. I believe these things. Well, I thought I believed them. I, I believed that I was a sinner. That's pretty important. I believed that Jesus died for my sins. And I was told if I believed those things, I'd be saved. But I had no desire for God. I was still stuck in my sinful lifestyle. I believed it, but it made absolutely no difference in my life. Why? I didn't see the gospel as a mystery. I saw it as something that I was meant to do in order to measure up to God's standards. I saw the gospel as what I needed to do to clean up my life, and I agreed to do, but I could never do it. The result was I was disillusioned with Christianity. And I just moved on with my life as it was. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important not to miss because uh, you really, as part of your testimony growing up, um, you you thought you were you were saved, and there was a there was a, an intellectual uh, maybe assent, if you will, but it really was short of of really saving saving grace. Uh, well, let let's tackle this uh, next mystery. And uh, you call it the mystery of the Spirit. Who reveals this mystery? Maybe it's in the title, but yeah, there you have it. The title, yeah. We are united by God to Christ by the Holy Spirit. Think about it. This is a holy, mysterious union. Union with the living Christ, the resurrected Christ. That union through the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that does it. We cannot make this happen on our own just by our intellectual choice. This is a miracle. Can you experience, uh, explain the miracle? Partially, but not completely. No, because this is not just an intellectual ascent where someone just decides to become a Christian on a purely intellectual basis. Remember Nicodemus. He was completely blown away. He was puzzled. He was flabbergasted and could not understand the mystery that Jesus was talking to him about in chapter 3 of John. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit as a person. And he is like a wind blowing wherever he wills. Nicodemus was asking how he could intellectually figure this out and to do it on his own. Jesus was telling the learned scholar Nicodemus that he could not do this on his own. There is no way I can understand these things as an unbeliever, of course. But I cannot understand them completely either as a believer by relying on my own abilities to understand. Yet we treat these things with familiarity. Instead, I must be actively relying on the Holy Spirit and asking him in prayer 
to open my eyes, the eyes of my heart. Nicodemus thought it was mysterious. He didn't know that it was impossible. Well, let's read Galatians 4, 5 through 7. To redeem those under the law, that we might receive our adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, you are also an heir through God. Tim Keller points out something important to notice in this passage. He says, look at verse 6 and verse 4. In verse 6, we have a parallel, the first one, God sent the Spirit. In parallel in verse 4, God sent his Son. The Son's purpose was to secure for us the legal status of our sonship. By contrast, the Spirit's purpose is to secure the actual experience of that sonship. The work of the Son brings us an objective legal condition that, that is ours whether we feel it every day or not. But the work of the Spirit is not like that at all. The Spirit brings a radical subjective experience. Mm -hmm. We need the work of the experience of the Spirit, and we need to ask for it. Not just presume, well, he'll give it. He's, he's in my life. He'll, no, we need to ask for it. The Spirit brings us into an Abba Father relationship, a subjective experience by mm -hmm. the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, so, so next, um, you want to talk about the mystery of uh, the light <laughs> as you term it here. Um, maybe talk to us about how the mystery is revealed. How did God do it? It was by a verbal command of God. Let there be light. Mm -hmm. God declares it and it happens instantaneously with his power and authority. Genesis 1-3, we see, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. At God's command, a giant fireball in the sky was instantly created to shine upon the earth. We have a little bit less today, I think. <laughs> this is <a> cool. <laughs> but hey, it's still shining there. It's just that we're blocked by some clouds. Uh, you, you might be thinking, of course, God created the universe at his command, and the light was from the fireball there in the sky. It was a spectacular miracle. And you'd be right. It, it, it is spectacular. However, the miracle of God declaring there is light in the heart of a blind rebel and even a dead sinner, this is also a remarkable miracle. Let's read two, uh, two passages in the New Testament that really kind of connect to, uh, to Genesis here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And notice, notice the language in here. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see the, the connection in John 1, 4, and 5, again, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Yeah, this is exactly what you're saying. Um, just like at creation, there's this uh, miraculous uh, decree that, that, uh, uh, that comes from God into our lives and brings light to our darkness. Yeah. Hmm. Let's look at uh, the mystery of the exchange in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Actually, I'll get into this verse uh, quite a little bit later uh, and examine it closer. Mm -hmm. yeah, so 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake 
he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we might become the righteousness of God? How is this? How could God do this? Me, a sinner, a rebel, be made righteous? That seems to be an impossibility. It's hard for us to fathom. We still think we need to measure up in some way. (laughs) But that's our default setting from our fallenness. I need to measure up. This happened in a moment of time by a verbal command. Oh, the wonder of the great exchange. It happened like a flash of lightning. My sins were transferred to Christ at God's command. And Christ's righteousness was transferred to you and me at God's command. The transfer of a righteousness outside of us was called by the reformers, as I mentioned, an alien righteousness, the righteousness of another, the righteousness of Christ, the perfect Adam. If I'm not overwhelmed by this fact that salvation and sanctification are done by God through the Spirit, we have lost the wonder and awe of the love of God. Just like the lukewarm Ephesian Christians in Revelation chapter 2. It is an act of God and we cannot Mm -hmm. understand it completely. That's great. I mean, it kind of uh, makes you go, wow. Um, There's this, you know, we receive Christ's righteousness uh, not progressively over time and we're working for it. No, it happens in an instant, uh, like you say. Um, That's great. What what joy that brings. Hmm. Uh, So let's let's maybe the the next question. the mystery of the impossible life. Where do we find uh, the the power uh, is where we're going to go next. Well, one of the most important discoveries of my life as a career missionary of 40 years has been that the gospel is not only for non-Christians. But the gospel truths, let me, let me say the gospel truths, as the, the doctrines of grace that we find in the gospel are key to our growth in Christ. We've come to understand that once, we're, once God saves us, he does not then move us on beyond the gospel. Heaven forbid. On the contrary, he moves us increasingly deeper into the gospel itself. The gospel in reality is every bit as important for the Christian's growth in transforming grace as it is to, for becoming a Christian in the first place. The gospel is the power that transforms Christians and makes them grow. Mm. We don't move beyond the gospel, or we shouldn't. Mm. We must continue to explore the depths of the truth of the gospel to grow and maintain the awe and wonder of our salvation. To miss this is to miss the importance of a cross-centered life and a spirit-empowered life. The question to ask ourselves is, where do I find the power to live the impossible Christian life? First of all, we need to admit that it is impossible for us to do that. The answer is that it is a mystery, but this mystery is revealed. Chapter 6 to 10, we'll deal with it extensively, uh, uh, this revealed mystery. Uh, It is by, just let me say briefly, it is by the empowering, enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Colin Smith puts it well, and this is the way he says, godliness, that is, for a God-centered life, godliness is not a system or a program. It is a person. 
The mystery of a fully God-centered life lies in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why using the term union with him is, I think, very important to be able to get away from abstract truths. Being a Christian, he continues, is more, more than believing in Jesus. It is the life of Jesus Christ in you by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the source of our life. Mm. And he, here's um, uh, an important verse. I'll just read 1 Timothy 3.16. Thanks for that. Um, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And let's look at Galatians 2.20. That is the foundation here, I think, the, this mystery exactly. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is folly to try to live the Christian life without the resurrected indwelling life of Christ. To try to live the Christian life without the life of Christ within is impossible. Listen carefully. Only Christ can live the Christian life in me and through me by my dependence upon the Holy Spirit. I want to ask uh, us to think about some questions, and here I'm going to evoke, uh, evoke them. How often do we live our lives in self-reliance. We're kind of used to that. Before we became Christians, living our Christian lives as Christian moralists by uh, relying uniquely on our own power. That's what Christian moralism is. It's not relying on the Holy Spirit not, or on God. How many times in the last 24 hours have we done anything with conscious dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit? This is because we're used to functioning in self-reliance. It's so common to us. It's so mm -hmm. automatic. But this is glorifying ourselves as good people, moralists, we kind of like that. And it's not for the praise and the glory of God. Mm. Do we even notice that this is the case? Or have we been so relying on self so much that we don't even know the difference? Mm. Mm. Um, I know you mentioned the question earlier, and, and maybe as, as uh, we're with growth partners, um, and I trust that's been, been going well, and you're finding a growth partner to learn together. Um, but you mentioned um, the question. You've asked this of me plenty of time. You mentioned earlier, how do I live by the life of another? I think that'd be a great question to talk about uh, together uh, when you're with your growth partner this week and connecting. Um, let's, but let's uh, look at uh, First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter uh, 1 Peter 1.4. I'll read it for us. He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We have become partakers of the divine nature with Christ living in us by the Holy Spirit. We have received the spiritual life which is in God, from all eternity, eternal life, life eternal, zoe in Greek, an uncreated life that is God's that he has given to us through the Holy Spirit. This is tremendous. 
But do we measure it? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. At least we don't daily. Mm -hmm. Let's read uh, Colossians 1.27, and another good one to, to note in your meditation this week through this. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the opposite of Christian moralism. This is not just trying harder to live the Christian life. This is the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live by the life of another. Hmm. Hmm. This is admitting that I cannot live the Christian life on my own with my own good moral intentions and with the strength and power of my own convictions but only Christ can live this life by his power through me as I walk by faith in him. Mm. The mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm. Well, we've talked a lot about mystery uh, today. Quite a bit. <laughs> uh, quite a bit. Um, what would you say is maybe the, uh, uh, the approach or the 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 mindset that we should take through this journey as we go. Someone reminded me recently that I had mentioned to them how they should read the book Into the Christian Life. I said, don't read it with presumptuous snobbery. <laughs> I always usually get some attention by that because I want people to think, what am, what am I actually saying? And the person said to me, Wow, I think I already did that. <laughs> Maybe I should read it again. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> we want to go into this journey with humility before God. And I'm going to read uh, one of uh, your favorites that, that you have uh, an illustration that, that you want to take us through. Uh, but Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So um, maybe you could kind of uh, help us uh, to illustrate uh, this verse and just kind of a note every week, we're going to kind of call it story time. I think it's an important thing to uh, to for ourselves as we're um, working through discipleship and partnering with others in, in the future that, that we maybe learn some ways to illustrate key concepts, whether it's righteousness or, you know, so say it in a different way. And Jesus did this, you know, he, he used parables to, to explain various things and illustrate. So uh, that's kind of what we're going to do, do now with story time and this guy. Well, as I tried to think about what would be appropriate for this story time. I was reminded of a uh, time when I was in seminary many years ago. One of my professors, his name was Dr. Uh, Dunham. Uh, this is not his picture, by the way, because we couldn't find one, one on the seminary website. And he's been long gone, so they don't have any pictures of him. Uh, he explained the mystery and unsearchable wisdom of God to us. We were young men who were peppering him with difficult questions that we wanted theological answers to. Now, his illustration helped me to take a dose of humility. I recreated the illustration that he, has, he gave to us back in the day. The bottom line, uh, horizontal line, is pictured as the length of time we have to know the things that God has revealed for us to know. If I'm 25 years old, then I would be a quarter of the way through. If I'm 50 years old, I would be halfway through. Well, I'm 76, so let's say 75, three, three quarters of the way through. Uh, if God gives me more life, uh, 
The, the vertical line is what God has revealed to us through Scripture. If I have not been studying much and just relying on Sunday school and sermon note, uh, sermons, then I might be a quarter of the way up, not 100%. That would be a presumption. Uh, but do we ever reach the maximum of 100%? The more I study these things, the more I realize what I don't know. We need to be humble. If we assume the top to be 100% of biblical knowledge and we spend 100 years studying the scripture, let's draw a line between the two and see what we have. So what would represent my Bible knowledge? You realize that you're only, you only have half of the whole rectangle. These are the things we can know. Doesn't mean that we will know all of these things even that has been revealed. But we are responsible for these things. No one should be so pretentious to think that we really know all of Scripture. Even if we could know all of it perfectly, that would only be an intellectual knowledge not, and not be wisdom and truth applied to life. The top triangle represents the things that God has kept secret. He has not revealed. He has not revealed those things to us and we are not tr to try to postulate and strive to comprehend that those things that God has chosen to keep secret. But what are these things on the bisecting line that separate uh, the revealed from the secret? Those things that God tells us something about, they're on the, the ones, our side of it, but not all of it is on our side. It's on the secret side. That's why there's mystery involved. Well, let's enumerate a few of them. How about the Trinity? We know something of the Trinity he talks about, but do I really grasp the Trinity? No. How about the return of Christ? Well, we know he is going to return, but when? <laughs> we don't know. How about election? We're actually going to get in this in, in chapter 3. So, patience, I'll, I'll give you some more ideas. But still, there's a lot of mystery involved. How about the purpose of evil in the world? Now, we can have some answers, but only partially. So, there is mystery mm -hmm. involved. We should be humble, realizing that I know little of the secret mysteries of God. And I even need the help of the Holy Spirit to fully know the things he's given me to know. We need to keep ourselves in mm. humble dependence on the Spirit mm. of God. Yeah, I love the, the illustration. I, I remember when you first told me that. And... Uh, I could picture the professor in front of uh, the that's class. The yeah, <laughs> and that's the way I pictured him right there, the, a senile old professor, but yeah. uh, wise nonetheless. Um, but yeah, a, a helpful illustration, I think, in fitting for us to see that there's things that are revealed that we're responsible for um, and other things that, that are secrets. Um, but I think a fitting response, uh, let's look at... Uh, Job, he had uh, a really, uh, I think, a fitting response for us to, to model and a little dose of, of humility. And I'll, I'll remind you of uh, Job 40, 1 through 5, the, the conversation with, with the Lord. The Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. What a fitting response to this uh, mighty, 
mysterious God that's revealed himself to us. Hmm. I want to leave you this morning with one thing. To not see the gospel as something very familiar. So familiar that you take it for granted. Instead, we want to see the gospel with wonder and awe. That the gospel is a mystery which miraculously transforms. Let's walk humbly before our God in this study. Mm. Amen. We are about out of yeah. time. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up here, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, next week in particular. This uh, this time today was, I think, helpful to help us. Uh, kind of put a framework uh, together for us. And as we study uh, through and kind of give us some questions um, uh, to make some connections as we go. So I think very helpful. Um, but next week, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we've been going through it, and um, it's a delight just to study uh, together. As I, as I go through these all the time, uh, I say, well, this chapter is really important. <laughs> but so is the next one. So is the next one. So, yeah. so we're revved up and ready to, ready to go. Um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, as we call it, not homework, but heart work. And uh, as you see here, uh, if Molly and Claire and the, uh, the Baker family can do some heart work, so can we. Um, we'll take a page out of their book of study. So, um, yeah, so next week we're going to be going through the righteousness of Christ, so chapter 1. Um, please uh, read that and uh, enjoy the chapter. Uh, connect with your uh, growth partner uh, before next week and have some conversations and uh, discuss uh, these topics, uh, discuss the question we talked about before. Uh, let's see, what other heart work do we have? Uh, yeah, I encourage you, I know I do this uh, in my uh, uh, copy, multiple copies. I've underlined and highlighted and circled and starred things. I used to not like to write in books. Now I do. Uh, but uh, please do, please highlight things or take some notes in your uh, your workbook. Uh, the, we're encouraging you to keep a workbook uh, because you're going to need these things as you help disciple others and we be become a disciple-making church. So there you have it. Um, other things? I think that's that's the balance of it. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll also include a little bit of Q&A time. So uh, please do... Um, uh, uh, here's the, the email address that you can send in questions. Uh, if as a, a growth partner a pairing, you're wondering or, or thinking or have something that you want to share, uh, please send it there and uh, we'll, we'll include that next time. Uh, if you need a, uh, if you have a, don't have a partner yet, uh, please give a shout. Feel free and send an email here uh, to me. I can help coordinate. And uh, also, um, you can text me, call me or grab me before, uh, before I leave. All right, anything else you're, you're thinking? Yeah. All right. Well, let me close this up in a quick word of prayer, okay. and, uh, and then we'll be on our way. Heavenly Father, we're just uh, uh, grateful to you um, that you, the, the wondrous God of all creation that, that has never had a beginning, will never have an end, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise God, Lord, that you, came, sent your Son, and revealed yourself, Lord, and that we can have your righteousness, and you empower us by your Holy Spirit to live a life that is glorifying to you. Mm -hmm. That is our aim, that is our desire, and Lord, we just praise you and thank you, and all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.